Welcome to the LSEG Sustainable Growth Podcast. I'm your host, Jane Goodland. And with me today is Alid Jones, who is a longtime friend and colleague, but also happens to be the head of sustainable investment indexes at FTSE Russell. So we've seen huge growth in passive investing and ESG. So we thought it would be interesting to talk about what sustainable investment indices are, how they've evolved over time, and take a look at some of the more complex solutions that we're seeing emerge. So without further ado, let's get into it. Well, hello, Ali Jones. What a delight to be able to speak to you today. So we go back a long, long way. We do. So I know pretty much all about your long career, but why don't you just give us a quick potted history so we can share with the lovely listeners uh, what you've been up to over the last 20 plus years? That would be my pleasure, Jane, and uh, lovely to be here. So, um, yeah, so I guess I sort of fall into these days the veteran category in the ESG <laughs> world. I'm not going to extend that to you, but you can take a view on whether that also applies. No, I really am. Yeah, I feel like I've been doing this for donkey's years and, and I've, I've had various roles in what's now, I guess, the whole industry of itself. Starting way back in 2001 when I was, I worked for a couple of firms, most notably one called Innovest. It was subsequently bought by MSCI, which is like an ESG research outfit. And that was back in the day when well, ESG wasn't even a, a, a term. Back then, it was more like SRI, like socially responsible investment. But anyway, that was in the very early days. And from there, I was, I've worked in asset management at places like Jupiter and what was then FNC is now called BMO Asset Management. Around the time of the financial crisis, I stepped over to the asset owner side. So I worked at a couple of large UK asset owners, one called the Pension Protection Fund. And then after that, one of the larger London-based local authority, LGPS funds called the London Pension Fund Authority. From there, I moved into investment consulting, actually somewhere that you worked, I think as well, Mercer. Yeah, I think I think actually, Alid, we were indeed rivals for a time, a few years, but you know. You're right, we were. Let's put that behind us. We're friends now, okay? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I did that for a while, I've got quite a few years, and then that was my last job prior to joining FTSE Plus back in 2017. So I've sort of been around the houses somewhat. I mean, the good thing is it's given me quite a broad and maybe unique perspective on things, having worked in different parts of the investment chain. Yeah. So you've worked for asset owners. Exactly. I mean, all of which I hope I'm putting to the benefit of our clients today. And so now you're focused exclusively on sustainable investment index solutions, right? So just give us a bit of an overview of what that means in in reality. So for the, what, five and a half or ish years that I've been in FTSE Russell, most of that time, or the vast majority of that time, I've worked in essentially a product development and product management role, very much focused on sustainable investment indices and largely on the equity side of things. Um, Very recently, I've shifted into a new role still in the same business, which is now, the team's now called Sustainable Investment Solutions, as you just mentioned. And that is still very much involved in the product side of things, but taking more of a sort of broad cross FTSE Russell view, multi-assets are looking at our fixed income as well as equities and and sort of working more on product level consistency, looking looking to all our data sets a lot more and working very closely with our product and sort of quant research teams to keep doing all that good stuff around developing ESG and climate products. So indexes or indices, I never quite know which one to use, but um, you can correct me, I'm sure, if I'm wrong. But these are really important pieces of market infrastructure in the context of what we call passive investing. And that's undergone really huge growth. So perhaps, I don't know, set the scene for us because I, th- I guess Traditionally, we kind of envisage fund managers picking stocks and also on the fixed income side, for example. So very much stock selection, asset selection. But that's not the game in passive, is it? So explain to us what it is and how it's grown over time. Exactly. Yeah, there's a very broad, we might call secular trend, right, which is the shift of assets from active to passive or more towards passive than they have been historically to the point where I, it depends on who you look at but we're now at either close to similar levels in both types of investment active and passive some some assessments say passive is slightly ahead or others slightly behind but it's basically grown from you know assets on a global basis mostly being managed actively to these days than being almost equal and I'm sure the passive trend will keep growing but as you say it's not about active stock selection and that kind of manager skill based approach that you see in the active world it's it's generally speaking fairly systematic rules based you know applying the same criteria across a very broad investment universe and creating an index or a benchmark 
benchmarks typically well i hope my colleagues don't feel i'm getting this wrong but to me a benchmark is a representation of say a whole market like the the FTSE 100 is a representation of the uk equity market an index could be the same but used perhaps more for funds and investment portfolio construction that kind of thing certainly i think of esg and climate indices of let's call them derived versions of the underlying index or benchmark but yeah you're right the growth in passive generally has been huge what's driven it alad is it mainly cost pressures or because that's really quite a substantial growth, right? So that it's kind of a big shift. And depending on where you look, the numbers vary quite considerably. But safe to say, now Passive is a massively important part of an investment toolkit. So why the shift? That could be quite a good strap line. Passive is massive. <laughs> Yeah. Did I say that? Is that mine? <laughs> I, I've, I think I've heard that before. We can say that was you. You, you coined it. Right? Um, I, I think largely cost, right? I mean, it's a sort of low, from an investment perspective, at least, it's a lower cost way of accessing market returns, be they broad equity market beta or in the fixed income market, etc. So I think that's a, a huge, a huge driver is the cost side of things. Probably also helped by things like in well, at least when I first joined FTSE, there was a big focus on what some people call smart beta, or we might call it alter- alternatively weighted approaches. In other words, creating indices that aren't based on what we call market cap, so just how big you are, basically, but on based on other what's called fundamental metrics that might give you a, a better insight into the drivers of risk and return. And then typically, they're things like you know momentum and size and value these kind of traits but anyway mm. i think that that has helped because you can do these things quite easily in passive as well but so i think the, the cost the cost side of things is, is a big driver right? there's, there's a general fee pressure downwards fee pressure across the industry for, for a long time now and i think from an esg perspective i think the growth in availability of data across all sorts of themes whether it's broad esg or specific issues within that or climate themes i mean that data is now much more available than it used to be and building it into index products or indices is is fairly straightforward so i think that's that's helped as, as you've seen the big rise in interest or use of passive just broadly esg has kind of ridden that wave as well i mean we've certainly seen it um at Fizzy russell and also we're seeing quite a lot more complexity in those esg or si indices aren't we so historically it would be i don't know something quite rudimentary like exclusion of certain sectors or stocks But now we see much more sophisticated approaches in terms of things such as the Transition Pathway Initiative indexes or indices. I really am going to have to get this right, aren't I? (laughs) But it's in terms of, you know, know, really trying to capture certain macro themes such as decarbonisation or growth of the green economy. But yeah, tell us about the different categories, if you like, of of ESG indices. I mean, this gets you into the... The wonderful world of definitions in our industry, right? Which are which are kind of used often interchangeably. I think, like, it's traditionally you've got, at least in my mind, you've got like exclusion-based approaches. You've, then you've got the big bucket, which is driven by things like the PRI of like ESG integration, which is a bit more about. I mean, so exclusions could be because you can't invest in certain things because maybe you're a faith-based investor or whatever. It's not aligned with your values. ESG integration, I guess, is a phrase or implementation approach let's call it was popularized by the umpri i think as a way to help mainstream these considerations by framing them as more as investment risks and i'd I'd say personally that's probably where most of the market tries to implement these things and then you've also got the impact investment side of things and then thematic as well which could sometimes overlap without going down a rabbit warren esg integration very much focused on protection of downside risk and taking that out of the portfolio from, from esg factors got that Impact and thematic. If that was a Venn diagram, there'd be quite a lot of overlap, wouldn't there? You're right. And it's kind of, I think it's some of these impact as a term probably is being somewhat stretched compared to its, what I'd say, its traditional definition. I say to me, right, impact investing is it needs to be very measurable what you're delivering in terms of positive outcomes or improvement. And I think the purist would say... Sorry, and that's in the context of social or environmental outcomes and impact, right? Yes, exactly. So, and I think sort of purists would say that, what's the phrase? It's like additionality. You have to be delivering something that wouldn't have happened anyway. So I think there's, if you take a very purist view of impact investing, there's probably very few really robust ways of delivering that. And also it lends itself much more to say unlisted private market type investments like the private debt fund folks on microfinance or maybe private equity that works with really small businesses delivering localized social impact, that kind of stuff. But these days, you know, there's a lot of listed equity funds that are positioning themselves as impact funds. And 
I'm not saying they shouldn't be, but it's just definitely being stretched. And then you're right, thematic could be it definitely overlaps, right? I mean, we th- th- this part of the spectrum, I think, is trickier in the index world just because of things like data availability in particular. But we we do, at least in first, you have something called the Environmental Markets Index Series, which is definitely a green thematic approach. Whether it's an impact approach, I guess, is up for discussion. But it's yeah, you know, it focuses very much on businesses that have a high level of revenue from green products and services, which I think yeah, you know, is definitely green thematic. But I think impact in a traditional sense in the index context is probably a bit harder to deliver. Not impossible, but it's just I think yeah, because generally speaking, not entirely, but generally speaking, where most people, the universes that most investors look to in in our world are sort of large, mid and small cap listed companies. Yeah, and, and a broad index at that, right? It, that, it, it's effectively capturing a market or a big segment of a market, right? Yeah. Good. Oh, I feel as if we've just had a lesson. That's fab. Well, <laughs> n- now, we now, now we're sort of on the same page in terms of the uh, definitions and categories. And I mean, I like to think of it as a spectrum, actually, in terms of the spectrum of investment and impact and lining them up and uh, where you put the slider ends up kind of where you are. In, you know, and we talked about ESG integration. I always think about that more down towards, in my mind, the left-hand side, which is fundamentally primarily focused on investment outcomes, but with an ESG lens in order to take away some of that downside risk protection. But who knows if I'm right. We, we touched on the sophistication of some of these indices. And one of the things I'm curious to dig into a bit is around how can and how it, how are actually, I'm sure that you're working with clients on this, how can investors get exposed to the decarbonisation trend and or effectively help fuel that decarbonisation activity through indices? And do we have examples of that in play at the moment? So it's, as you would expect, I, I, I guess, right, that that's a huge area of interest, certainly in Europe, but not, not exclusively in Europe, that this whole decarbonisation, net zero portfolio construction theme, let's say, is has become massive. I and mean, this is a good example, actually, of how the world we operate in kind of ESG standard investment have evolves very, very quickly. So not that long ago, I mean, probably around the time I and from just before the time I joined FTSE, so we were talking sort of 2016, 2017, the discussion at the portfolio level for investors around climate change was very focused on carbon emissions and fossil fuel reserve exposure and that whole stranded asset debate. And that kind of like, was it Carbon Bubble, that report by... Um, it, carbon Tracker. That's a Carbon Tracker, that kind of... I think it was called Unburnable Carbon or something like that, yeah. You're absolutely right. I think that was around 2015. But that was kind of, the focus was very much in terms... Uh, uh, and we think of the data as well, is about carbon emissions and fossil fuel reserves. And that was where, you know, and it was about reducing your exposure to those things, largely as a proxy for climate risk in the future. And presumably, and also divestment from fossil fuels. Yep was a quite a dominant conversation right exactly it was like yeah it's like ex fossil fuel or maybe low carbon approaches and that was reflected in the industries that were around at the time in fact i remember doing a project when i was at mercer for a i think it was a big spanish pension fund looking at esg indices and that was the and it was around 2014 time it was the first time i'd really looked at these products and there was so little i mean i could fit a table on one page of A4 to cover everything that was out there. And it was mostly kind of ESG focused. And so FTSE was on there for, for things like FTSE for Good, which is a long-standing, more kind of ESG focused approach. But climate indices didn't really exist back then. But anyway, fast forward to now. So I guess you're talking, what, almost a decade later, but probably less than that. The debate is all about net zero, which is a very different level of complexity. So it's not just about being having lower exposure to fossil fuels and, and high emission companies. It's about bringing in increased exposure to the green economy and in, in particular, especially through things like the way the EU has approached this with its kind of regulations and climate benchmarks, it's about delivering this kind of like year-on-year decarbonisation pathway in a portfolio. And that's a whole level, as you've mentioned, of complexity, which is different to what people were thinking about in previous years. And also you need different data sets that, that have only really existed for probably sort of three, four years. Yeah, climate transition plans, right? So we're only now doing that, aren't we? Yeah, exactly. And it's extremely interesting and exciting for people like me that get to work with this stuff. But it's, um, it's yeah, that in a very narrow space of time, I guess the point I'm making is this, the debate on this and what people are trying to do or investors are trying to do has has jumped massively forward, which is great to see. So what are the index products looking like then? If an investor sort of rings up one morning and says, hi, Alid, I'd like to invest in decarbonisation, what would you recommend for them? 
So on our side, um, from in Footsie, we and this is not a sales pitch. This is just yeah, trying yeah. to understand kind of what does, what does an index look like. Funny you should mention that, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> I should be on commission. I'm not. It's that blue pizza. Here's something I made earlier. Yeah, I mean we've got. I mean you know, everyone's looking to do things like this, not least because of the EU climate benchmark regs. But um, we'd already been working on what I would call a broadly Paris aligned index series called the TPI Climate Transition Index Series, which we we worked with Church of England Pensions Board to develop back in before we started talking to them in 2018 maybe even early yeah 2018 so i just i just after i joined FTSE russell and that was launched in yeah, it was back into 2018 and that was we developed that over the course of 2019 and we launched it in 2020 and then at the same time in parallel the eu was doing its thing around looking at these eu climate benchmarks so but we have this tpi index series which captures data from the transition pathway initiative which is the tpi bit of the index name and that is around just for clarity by that when we talk about tpi transition pathway initiative that is effectively assessing companies transition plans and the extent to which they are actually aligned with the goals of the paris agreement exactly it's exactly that they look at company level commitments like around at the strategy operational level, they also look at, as you say, like these commit longer term commitments to decarbonize their business. So we take that data and build it into the index series alongside things like carbon reductions versus the benchmark, uh, green revenue exposure being increased versus the benchmark, etc. So that's one pre-existing index series. And then we have another index series called the FTSE EU Climate Benchmark Series, which extends that same approach, but brings in these additional requirements under the EU regs that created that particular benchmark series. And the main difference between the two things is the EU approach, you have to have this year-on-year decarbonisation pathway. So your portfolio has to reduce its emissions exposure essentially over time, which is now becoming quite a widely adopted tool, even if people don't adopt the -the off-the-shelf EU approach, this idea of a pathway in your portfolio. And that definitely increases the complexity and and challenges around building these kind of products, right? Because you're you're forcibly creating a profile, let's call it, at the index level that is potentially quite different from the underlying universe. So you start, you know, because you're saying, okay, this portfolio has to decarbonize in line with the Paris goals of hitting net zero by 2050. But to be honest, the wider economy and the world at large is not on that same pathway. So you, the risk is from the investment side is that you start diverging potentially significantly over time, depending on what happens in the rest of the world, from your underlying benchmark, which you always measure yourself to. So there's lots of discussions with clients about that and how you can manage it and what things you can build into indices to help some of that, I guess, that, that kind of risk, I said, I guess. But presumably investors who, and I'm talking about institutional investors here, who are looking to get exposure to those types of instruments, I mean, they must understand that they're not buying something that is necessarily going to replicate market light investment returns because effectively the index is trying to do something quite different. But but I can see how there needs to be a lot of conversation and understanding about what investors are getting so that there's no... I guess, misalignment in terms of expectations. Yeah. And asset owners in particular, which I mean, sort of pension funds for the most part, but it could be, you know, other large sort of wealth funds. But we, we speak to a lot of pension funds at FTSE Russell, who are many of whom are, you know, have made quite big commitments to decarbonize their overall portfolio and therefore very interested in these kind of approaches. They, pension schemes in particular, they have constraints around risk in particular, right? So they're always looking at how to allocate their their investments across different asset classes and often using up something called a risk budget so sort of which is often in the equity world at least based on I guess historical volatility of returns or quite often in our world it's, it's based on tracking error which is in broad in a broad sense how much your index or portfolio based on that index deviates from the underlying benchmark or market and they have to manage their investment strategy within these constraints so you can't on the one hand they very keen to push the sort of climate improvements as far as possible, but they're very, very conscious of deviating significantly and taking on too much investment risk, let's say, that pushes them outside of their overall allowance uh, at a whole fund perspective. So, and that's that's a challenge that you just have to work with. But it is, it's an interesting one, right? Because the world isn't decarbonizing quickly enough, essentially, and to then replicate 
a portfolio that is, like I said already, does start to push you away from the underlying market and therefore your tracking error, for example, starts to go up and you see things like your industry exposures can change a lot. Even sometimes your stock levels, a single stock exposures can change quite a lot. So there's a lot of conversation with asset owners in particular about those parameters. Where you can sit down and eyeball the, the asset owner and have that conversation at, at that level I'm thinking about what some of the limitations are for for sustainable investment indices. And immediately I'm thinking that one of the limitations might be around taking a more, we're talking about quite sophisticated solutions here, right? So would it be fair to say that one of the limitations could be of taking something like that into the retail market might be a trickier, but I guess I fundamentally, my, my question is, is what can't these indices do? What can't they really deliver? Because, I mean, so far, so good, right? It, sound, it sounds like they're, um, they've evolved, they've become more sophisticated, they're doing decarbonisation, but surely there's stuff they can't do. I guess, you know, indices work, conventional arts work in better in some cases than others. I mean, they work very well in a sort of broad, for broad market exposure. So it's essentially what a lot of our investment clients are doing is shifting, maybe they've got a big allocation to equities through a passive fund, like developed market equities, let's say. And they're often, or increasingly, we're seeing them shifting that exposure from a sort of bog standard vanilla market cap, non-SI approach into something that captures SI considerations and increasingly climate. And and then within these constraints we discussed. But challenges arise, especially with these sort of net zero pathway-based approaches as you move into narrower markets like the, so maybe some of the smaller single country markets that have much fewer constituents in so like our developed market equity benchmark series the FTSE developed has something like 2000 stocks in it if you go to the italian equity market a single country equity university has something like 60 stocks in it. and then the FTSE 100 which we'll probably talk about at some point has 100 stocks and it's a very different ball game delivering a decarbonisation approach from a net zero perspective in those smaller markets compared to a very, very large global market. And and sometimes it might even just not be possible, depending on what your constraints are. If you don't mind deviating from the underlying benchmark, which is very, very hard for us owners, then there's more you can do. And actually, you, you mentioned the sort of retail market. That market, which is things like ETFs and that kind of stuff, that, that tends to be the tolerance for things like tracking error and deviation from the underlying universe or benchmark tends to be higher than you would for a typical asset owner because they're they're not constrained by an investment strategy and risk budgets and they're not looking at liabilities and trying to trade these things off. The the typical retail investor wants to just invest in equities or an ESG fund or a climate fund. So I think that's partly why if you look at good reliable market stats on this kind of stuff are quite hard to come by. But the growth in the ESG ETF market has been significant. I was having a little dig around earlier. I mean, one there's one outfit that tries to track this and they say at the back end of last year, it was something like $400 billion now sitting in the ESG ETFs. And it was less than $50 billion just back in 2018. So the, kind of the recent growth has been phenomenal. I mean, I, and it's it's still small compared to the overall ETF market, but the growth rates have been, I mean, actually sky high, partly because there's, there's more, on the one hand, actually, there's more flexibility based on what I was just saying. But actually, the constraint you have in that world is more around complexity. So whereas with a big asset owner who've got the time and the people to kind of understand a more sophisticated methodology, which could be like a net zero approach, in the in the retail market, you tend to need much simpler approaches that are easy to understand, which is why things like exclusion-based approaches tend to do quite well in our experience. So I'm not sure that answers your question, actually. <laughs> no, it does. I mean, my reflection on your comments are that actually, when you start a conversation about passive investing, it seems quite simple and then it oh so quickly gets oh so more complicated, doesn't it? You know, when you think about the different types and the different constraints and the different investor audiences. No, it's, it's, it's all fascinating stuff. I wanted to also touch on some of the things you mentioned about main market indices and ESG versions. And I know that, for example, we've had developed market ESG versions or all world versions. But one of the missing pieces of the puzzle in the past has been effectively an ESG equivalent to the FTSE 100, which is, of course, like the iconic UK equity index. So I hear that that has been addressed. So do tell. Yeah, something I've been working on with the wider team for uh, for a while now, like the last year at least, is is looking at the FTSE 100 in particular, as you mentioned, like a real 
core flagship product, one one of the things we're probably best known for alongside things like the Russell series in the US, which is the sort of default uh, US equity benchmark series. Yeah, I mean, historically, I guess it's sort of been our attention on this has been driven by client interest and client queries, which for a long time didn't exist. And this, I think the reason the clients have been asking more and more about things like this to 100, which is a very specific universe, you know, just 100 stocks, large cap UK, is a reflection of the growth in the, let's call it the ESG market for shorthand in general. So when I first joined FTSE 5 plus years ago, conversations were really focused on these broad developed and emerging market universes. So FTSE developed FTSE your world. And I think that reflected the kind of portfolios people were looking at. But as I guess as they fill out their ESG on climate portfolio allocations, the focus has gone more and more towards regional and then single country underlying universes. So a couple of years ago, we started to get questions about FTSE 100, and we sort of dug into it, like I said, about a year ago. Now, it's it's a tricky one, right? The, the UK market is, um, from an ESG perspective, it's very overweight carbon. It's a very narrow universe. There's a few, depending on what your perspective is, there's a few, let's, let's say, maybe contentious products that are being produced by some of the companies in that, in that universe. We've got quite a lot of resource companies in there, haven't we? Resource, yeah. We've got, you know, we've got big tobacco companies, which is a traditional exclusion for a lot of ESG funds. There's, there's lots of stuff in there. So it's 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 reasonably challenging in that sense. And it's all very big companies. We do actually have quite a few products based in the UK market that exist already. So we have things like Fitsy for Good. We have the Environmental Market Series I already mentioned, so green thematic versions. We have an exclusions only based approach called the Global Choice. What we didn't have was this sort of broad, let's call it broad ESG approach that sits very much in that ESG integration category we talked about earlier. We didn't have that. And in in particular, we didn't have it for the FTSE 100. We had a couple of things in the FTSE All Share, which is the sort of full UK market. And most of the other things I mentioned are based on slightly different cuts of the UK universe, but it's kind of the real, what we call the UK equity series, which is the FTSE 100, 250, 350 in All Share. We didn't have a kind of off the shelf broad ESG version of those benchmarks. So that's where the focus has been. Until now. Until now. So we're just, <laughs> yeah, sort of fre- fresh off the production line. We, we have that. It's called the ESG, FTSE UK ESG Risk Adjusted Index Series. It's a bit of a mouthful, but we've tried to make the naming of it as clear as possible to indicate that, that yeah, this is what I would call an ESG adjusted version of the underlying universes. You are going to see some big names in there exactly and and, it, and presumably it's going for market like returns right so it's exactly it, it's trying to deliver similar investment returns to the FTSE 100 if yeah. there was no ESG at all no absolutely and and you know I guess the exam question we were given by the clients we've been speaking to was was that try and can you deliver something that's relatively simple or straightforward captures some of the sort of key ESG risks for the for that market let's say but it doesn't deviate too much from the underlying risk return characteristics and also tries to stick for the FTSE 100 in particular tries to stick as close as possible to that level of constituents of around 100 which obviously we can't do because some exclusions are applied but out of interest what are those exclusions so there's the three main parameters we're looking at so the, I guess the objective of the index is to reduce ESG risk exposure let's say in a very broad sense and we've, we're looking at ESG scores, carbon exposure, which includes scope one and two emissions and fossil fuel reserves exposure. And then we've looked at various products categories for exclusions and also like a controversy or controversial conduct category as well. So the exclusions are things like tobacco, controversial weapons, thermal coal, and this this conduct screen essentially, and we've got different thresholds. Some of them, some of them is like any exposure. Some is revenue threshold based. Sorry, there's sorry, there were some additional fossil fuel categories as well, which was around maybe the slightly more controversial end of the fossil fuel extraction market to call it that. So things like Arctic exploration, tar sands, and essentially fracking, shale gas, I think it's called. So that's they're applied. So relatively broad range of exclusions. So they're the exclusions, they're blanket. Yeah. So that's also aligned with an existing series we have in the US called the Russell US ESG series. So we're trying to create uh, hopefully an expanding series of ESG adjusted single country universities. So we've got US, we've got UK here, and we can look at other markets over time. And so then when you've got the rest of the companies, then what, what sort of ESG risk are you looking to reduce versus the, the mainstream index? From an ESG front, like that, the underlying universe, if you look in aggregate, like the, the aggregate ESG score or performance, whatever you want to call it, of the FTSE 100 or the UK in general is very, very high when you compare it to other markets. It's like, it's something like 10% higher or or almost 10% higher 
compared to the FTSE All Shares, so the full UK market, it's almost 15% higher than the broad global developed universe. So it's already got a very high aggregate ESG profile, let's say. So we're big companies, good disclosure, lots of resources to throw at it, kind of thing. Yeah. And I guess the kind of sectors that have taken, let's be honest, a lot of flack over the years and have made efforts to try to address that. And they definitely have the ability to put more disclosure out there. I guess it's up to others to take a view on whether things are being delivered or not. But just if you if you look at companies just based on ESG scores, which you know, which try to measure the extent to which companies are looking to manage operational ESG issues, let's say, then these companies tend to do very well compared to a global average. So really what we're trying to do on that front, because the FTSE 100 and the UK in general is already very high on that basis, we're really looking to not make sure the index is never below the benchmark level. So we've set this kind of 5% up to make sure it's always above. To push it much further than that starts to create challenges from an index construction perspective, if I'm honest. So you could argue broad ESG risk is relatively low for the UK because the companies are doing fairly well already. The main risk, which is the sort of final of the three pillars, I guess you could call it, is the carbon side of things. Now, as I mentioned, like the UK is very overweight carbon compared to other markets because, as you've mentioned, there's a lot of resource companies, whether it's oil and gas or basic materials or mining companies. So we're looking to reduce exposures to carbon reserves, fossil fuel reserves, by 50% versus the underlying benchmark. And then carbon intensity is also reduced by 50% versus the benchmark because there's also a lot of emissions in the UK. We've got utilities and those energy companies and mining companies also have quite high emissions intensity. So the three things together, we believe, deliver a kind of overall improvement in these broad ESG characteristics, let's say. I, I think it's really exciting and it's been a missing piece of market infrastructure, I think, for quite some time. So I think it's really great and I can understand why it's quite complicated, but fingers crossed it's going to um, be received well and will help to develop the market further and complete the toolkit for investors because that's the idea, right? Exactly. And that's the point. We're, we're, we're filling what we see as a gap in our existing UK equity product range. We're delivering something that we've been asked for by the market and clients. And it's, you know, this is ESG 1.0 for this particular UK uh, series and the first few hundred, et cetera. But we will definitely enhance and evolve this over time. We've tried to target something that works in the current context based on available data, based on the direction of travel on things like SI regulations, but also client expectations. But this will this will need, like a lot of SI products to be honest, it will need to evolve over time. You can't you can't expect to create something and just leave it forever. We have to make sure we're kind of evolving it over time. And if investors say to us, actually, there should be more exclusions or maybe you should be more ambitious on certain parameters, we'll definitely look to adjust that over time. Your phrase around this additional tool in the toolkit is the important one. We're not saying this is the only way to address ESG issues in the UK context. Like it's not a climate index. We have other versions of the UK market that are much more focused on climate. It's a broad ESG approach. It's something that we didn't have and we we hope it um, works for client needs. Alid, it's been fascinating and and a lot more complex and complicated than perhaps we might have thought from the outset. Well, hopefully not too complicated. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and your wisdom and, and your, you know, the real life example of sustainable investment index solutions. I think it's been really, really interesting indeed and look forward to seeing how this evolves over time. So thank you and see you soon. Thanks very much. It's been a pleasure. So that's it for this week's episode of the LSEG Sustainable Growth Podcast. And I hope you agree that was a fascinating conversation with Alid Jones. If you're not already following us, then please do follow us and rate us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or any other podcast platform. And of course, if you've got any questions, comments or someone you'd like us to talk to next, then drop us a line at fmt at lseg.com. Thanks for listening. See you next time.